So uh, I hope you guys are enjoying this TED thing as much as I am. This, uh, this concept of ideas worth spreading is just a fantastic thing. I think that we should thank the Greeks for actually developing this general concept with their, you know, in the Agoras way back when, and they were able to start sharing ideas, and we're continuing to do that same thing through this wonderful social discourse that can go on with social media. I'm an Arctic guy. I study Arctic science, and uh, I get paid to study that picture that's animating up there. That's pretty weird, eh? When I go to a cocktail party and I tell people what I do, they kind of run away from me usually. The idea is that what you're seeing in that animation is the northern hemisphere of your planet Earth, where you live. It's covered with uh, an ocean, but on top of that ocean is a sea ice cover. The sea ice cover is this thing that's moving here that looks like it's alive. And what you're seeing is a one-day time step of what the ice cover looks like in the northern hemisphere looking down at the pole. There's Greenland here, Canadian Arctic Islands here, Alaska, Russia. And what happens is the ice shrinks back in the summertime as the sunlight returns to the Arctic, and that causes the sea ice cover to shrink. It shrinks back to a minimum extent, and what you see on this plot over here is what's been happening with that summer minimum extent each year. So when I started my research work in the Arctic, I was starting right back over here. I'm getting to be an old guy now. And uh, there wasn't much happening, really. It wasn't no big changes going on in the sea ice cover. We never really thought that sea ice would become sort of a fundamental characteristic of our uh, international discourse about global warming and the fact that our planet is warming at a, at a global scale. But in fact, that's what's happened. So as we see this summer ice cover uh, shrinking, we're seeing this kind of rate of decrease right here. And we're going to have at some point in the near future no ice in the northern hemisphere in summer. Now that's a very major change that's happened on our planet system. And I work with a whole bunch of scientists from all around the world that study this, and we study the sea ice itself. We also study the connections with glacial ice and the land and all those kind of things. But when you look at what's happening to the sea ice cover, this change that we have, this reduction that you see there, we found recently that this is significant over at least the last 1,450 years. So that includes the last... Uh, um, uh, medieval warm period, it includes the cold periods before that, it includes right up to before the Industrial Revolution. So in fact what we're seeing in the Arctic right now is unique to our time scale of what we're talking about on the planet. To do this work we have a whole bunch of tools. Our, one of our largest and most visible tools is the research icebreaker, the Amundsen. And the Amundsen is a ship that will hold 40 scientists and it holds 40 crew members and we can deploy to the Arctic anywhere in the Arctic for any amount of time. So we've overwintered now twice in the high Arctic, and we're studying everything in this system. So we study everything from the bottom of the ocean to the top of the atmosphere in the physical world, everything from viruses to whales in the biological world, and all the connections between those. This takes a lot of people. So the networks are not just here at the University of Manitoba, but we have a national network called ArcticNet, which includes Laval University and many other universities across the country. We also have an international network, which includes universities uh, around the world that study the Arctic. We're very proud of the fact that our research icebreaker was highlighted on the back of your $50 bill. So if any of you would like me to sign the $50 bill you have in your pocket, I'd be happy to do that for you. Now I could talk for a long time about this, I you know, write books about these kind of things, but I wanted to just highlight a few key things that are happening. And these are things that we were surprised about. So I'm a guy that spent 30 years now working in the Arctic, and this stuff is surprising me. So I thought I'd just sort of put those together as seven surprises, if you will. First one is multi-year sea ice is being replaced with very thin first-year sea ice. So multi-year sea ice, if you look up at the ceiling, is thicker than what you see here to the ceiling. It's sort of five to 10 meters thick. It's really, really thick, really, really hard. When I started working in the Arctic, it was all over the place. Now there's only 12% of the Arctic left with that kind of ice in it, and it's being replaced with this young stuff. And this young stuff is very saline. It's very salty. Remember, it's an ocean that this ice forms on. And what happens is you get these pretty little frost flowers. So that little image you see is a delicate little crystal flower that grows up out of the ice. Very saline. If you were to taste it, you'd spit it out right away because it's 100 parts per thousand salty, like really, really salty. The other thing is we're finding uh, crystals in the ice itself called icaite, which is associated with how CO2 moves through the system. So up until just recently, we thought the ocean was capped by this ice cover and that CO2 couldn't move between the ocean and the atmosphere. CO2 is the big problem, right? This is what's causing our planet to warm. And we thought that it was decoupled in the Arctic, but we're finding, in fact, it's not. This young sea ice actually plays an active role in exchanging carbon dioxide with the surface. 
There are similar processes going on with bromine, mercury, and they're very reactive with the atmosphere. So we're very concerned about what these young ice types mean for the evolution of the Arctic atmosphere. Snow on sea ice is also very important. Snow falls on the sea ice. When it, forms, when it falls on ice that's already there, it forms a thick blanket. It insulates that ice so the ice can't grow as thick as it would have otherwise. If it falls in the open ocean, it does absolutely nothing at all. So what that's doing is it's protecting this multi-year sea ice from growing too thick, which means that it gets thinner and thinner each year because the snow cover doesn't allow it to grow as thick as it used to be. Of course, this is affecting the animals that live in this environment, in particular polar bears. You've probably heard in the media that, you know, polar bears, the sea ice is disappearing. This is an important habitat for the polar bear. So what's going to happen with our polar bears? You know, we have lots of them here in Manitoba. We have lots of them in Canada. Well, unfortunately, it's not a, as simple and straightforward as reduction in sea ice means reduction in polar bear habitat. It's much more complicated than that. Multi-year sea ice, polar bears can't dig into it. They can't get to the seals. The seals don't dig into that kind of ice, so it's not a preferred habitat. The first year ice that is replacing the multi-year sea ice is the preferred habitat. So in some places, the habitat for polar bears is actually improving, and in other places, it's getting worse. The big problem is when you remove all the sea ice and you have open water. In those areas, the length of that open water is really important because the polar bears have to go on land and have to be able to forage on the sea ice. They have to wait for it to happen in the fall. When you look at the rest of the ecosystem in the Arctic, a good way to think about it is that the sea ice acts like the trees in a tropical rainforest. If you're sitting in your seat right now and you think, okay, if we clear cut all the tropical rainforest trees, we can expect there to be an impact on everything in the tropical ecosystem, right? Well, sea ice plays exactly the same role. If you get rid of all the sea ice, it changes the light environment and the heat environment, which affects everything that lives in the ocean because the ocean has evolved to take advantage of the timing and presence of the sea ice. So in fact, our research work shows that the change in sea ice is affecting everything in the marine system, right from the very smallest viruses and bacteria all the way up through the food chain to polar bears, ring seals, those kinds of things. We haven't found anything yet that isn't. Another thing we're finding about the ecosystem is that invasive species are becoming a key thing in the Arctic. So on the Atlantic side of the Arctic, we're getting species moving north and displacing the Arctic species. Same's happening on the Pacific side. The other thing that we're finding about the Arctic is that it is not what it necessarily appears to be from space. So the Arctic is really hard to get to, right? It's not, I mean, probably very few of you have been in the high Arctic in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. It's very difficult to get there. And we rely on space to tell us what's going on. That animation at the beginning of my presentation was a series of space-borne satellites that give us that kind of animated picture of what's going on. Well, in fact, in 2009, we had our research icebreaker down here, and we went up this line that you see right here in this this figure, and all of these colors of red and, and darks, those all should be multi-year thick sea ice. And in 2009, what we found was it wasn't. It was a form of rotten sea ice. It was so rotten, in fact, that the ship that we have does 13.5 knots in open water, and we were able to traverse that ice at 13 knots, so almost the same speed as in perfectly open water. Yet the satellites all thought it was very thick multi-year sea ice because that's what it had always traditionally been. The Chinese took their research icebreaker from China and came up this way, thought they would get stopped somewhere around here, and they were able to go all the way to the pole in 2010. The Germans in 2011 and 2012 had expeditions to the North Pole. They couldn't find ice solid enough to put crews out on in the summer. They were wanting to put scientific instruments out. We couldn't find ice that was thick enough to do that. So this rotten ice now is pervasive in the summertime, so in the months of August and September, most of the central Arctic is this very heavily decayed ice, which we call rotten ice. Now, of course, that has a dramatic effect on transportation. So the world is now looking at transportation corridors across the pole. It's just like when you fly, if you take the northern circle route, it's way shorter than if you go around the bulge of the planet on the equator. So all the world's economies are looking at the cost savings that would be from taking a tanker from China to Europe, for instance, either through the northern sea route or across the pole route, or even the Northwest Passage route through northern Canada. One of the things that's a bit paradoxical about this reduction in sea ice is that we're actually seeing an increase in ice hazards. Well, what, how does that make sense? I mean, you're, the ice is decreasing. Doesn't that mean that it should be less hazardous? Well, in fact, it doesn't seem to be the case. And this was a surprise to us. Like, this video is from the helicopter on board our icebreaker, and we're landing just in front of that little nose cone that you see out there. We're going to land on a piece of a uh, tabular iceberg that comes from shore. It was attached to a glacial piece of ice which then broke off, went into the marine system, and is now encapsulated with the motion of the sea ice. That thing is uh, 120 meters thick. 
You cannot break it with an icebreaker. You can't, <laughs> you just have to get out of its way. If it's coming towards you, you can't have a drill ship there. You can't do any of those kind of things. The other thing that was surprising to us is just how thick some of the multi-year ice is. So this picture here I took from a little, we call them skippy boats. They're like a Florida Everglades boat. We use them to go around in the ice cover nearby the ship. And that ice cover there was typical multi-year sea ice, but it was 30 meters thick because the ice is moving very quickly. It piles up on itself. When it piles up on itself, it can actually get thicker in very localized areas in the Arctic. And so this was a big surprise to us as well. This idea of the ice being able to move faster is also a big hazard. So when you think about the Arctic Basin, if you think of that animation I showed you, just think about filling it up with styrofoam and then blowing a wind over top of the styrofoam. It's, if it's full of styrofoam, it's not going to blow around very much. But if you reduce how much styrofoam is in there, take a bunch of pieces out, blow the same wind across it, and that styrofoam is going to go like crazy. And that's exactly what's happening in the Arctic. So ice hazards are an issue of if you see that big tabular iceberg coming to you and you're in a drill ship, you need X number of hours to deconnect that drill ship and get it out of the way, because if you don't, it's just going to wipe it out. So that's the problem with these ice hazards. The last one I wanted to tell you about is a paradoxical thing that is happening right now with our climate system. And this is very much a hypothesis that we're working on. We're not, there's no conclusions here. It's just what we're working towards understanding. And that is, as we reduce the amount of ice cover over the pole, we open the ocean, and the ocean loses its heat to the atmosphere, and that causes the atmosphere to have a lower pressure value than it would normally have. The diagram on your left up here, this one here, shows what the polar vortex should look like. If you listened to media last winter, you would have heard this name come up a lot on the media. The polar vortex is causing this cold weather in southern Canada. Well, what's happening is traditionally this polar vortex would keep the cold air in, encapsulated in the Arctic. This is what the polar vortex has been starting to look like over here. It's all broken up. And the reason it's broken up is there's so much more heat coming out of the ocean into the atmosphere. So it isn't able to retain this cold air over top of the poles. And the circulation that's associated with this is also changing. So you'll see on some of the diagrams when you see a meteorologist talking about how loopy the jet stream is. Well, this jet stream is looping much further down over the continents now, bringing this cold air down over the continents, both our side of the planet and the other side of the planet. And there's pretty good evidence starting to mount now that it is related to the ongoing reduction of sea ice cover in the northern hemisphere. So again, it's a paradoxical thing with a warming climate to get colder temperatures at lower latitudes of our planet. So just in summary, to sort of recapitulate some of these things, this idea of a saltier ice surface is something we're very concerned about because it leads to UV reduction, or sorry, UV increase in these surfaces because of the reduction of ozone. It also changes how mercury moves through the system and it changes how CO2 moves through the system. So for instance, we don't even know for sure whether the Arctic Ocean is going to become an overall source or a sink for CO2. That's a pretty important thing because the Arctic Ocean is very big and from a planetary perspective, that's very important. The second one, snow is a very big complicating factor. Snow is this natural feature. As we increase the amount of open water in the Arctic, we get more snow. When that snow falls on ice, it doesn't let the ice grow as thick as it would have otherwise. It does improve habitats for certain animals and makes habitat worse for other animals. But when that snow falls in open water, it does absolutely nothing at all. You don't even notice an effect. Polar bear habitat is improving in some areas and not improving in other areas. It is something that is of concern to a lot of people because polar bears are something we identify with as being an Arctic species. They're very specific to the Arctic. They're, they're something that we're all very concerned about and the management of those is very important as well. Unfortunately, we found that the entire marine ecosystem in the Arctic is being affected. Everything from the very smallest viruses and bacteria right up through the food chain to the highest predators. We haven't found anything that has not been affected by this. When we first got into this research, we, th we didn't really think that way. We thought, well, you know, the species are quite adaptable. They should be able to change to these local conditions. But in fact, the changes that are happening in the Arctic are so rapid that the marine system can't respond to it. And it's the same with the humans. You know, the Inuit who live in the Arctic are seeing these changes as much more rapid than anything they've seen before as well. So for instance, they have new words now for bumblebee and sunburn and things that didn't used to occur in the Arctic are now starting to occur in the Arctic. So it's very pervasive everywhere. The fifth one is this idea of rotten ice is a new thing. We only saw it in 2009. We didn't know it existed before that. And it's consistent. It's happening each of the other years right through up until 2014. We just returned with our research icebreaker from the center of the Canadian 
basin, and we couldn't find ice uh, sufficiently strong to put out our crews on in the end of August and the beginning of September this year. It was too heavily decayed because of the, uh, the uh, warming that's going on in the summertime. What is the big paradox for us from an ice hazards perspective is one of the things that people are looking at the Arctic for is to increase development. CO2 is the thing that is causing a lot of this issue of our warming planet, yet it is opening up the Arctic for new development. And so people around the planet are interested in developing these resources that are there. And of course, the big resources are oil and natural gas. There's also lots of minerals and transportation is a big thing, but we have to remember that there are hazards that are still there and uh, we need to pay attention to those when we think about how to develop these resources sustainably. The last one is this issue of the polar vortex. Again, this is a a hypothesis that we're working on, but it appears that there's evidence mounting that what is happening in the high Arctic because of the changing pressure patterns is affecting our weather where we live in the temperate and even the, the tropical parts of the planet. It's very important that you remember that you live on planet Earth and it is a unit, it functions as a unit. It doesn't operate as Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Ontario, British Columbia, Northern States, right? It operates as a whole unit. And unfortunately, it doesn't come with a manual. So we have to figure it out. And that's what research groups like mine do, is we try to figure out what these characteristics are so that we can inform you and we can spread these ideas on really cool things like TED. Thanks a lot.